here for? We're here for Galatians. And I thought I would... This is not the final double column set up. But I think it helps for reviewing the main points where we've come from all of which leads up to where we're ending in chapter 3. So I think I began this study by saying something about how our own interests, whether they are personal interests, that is they sort of arise from within, from our circumstances, or the interests of the church or Christian group that we're a part of, those two things tend to direct the way we read the Bible. And so no one would actually say it, but I think in personal Bible reading, you might read the Bible with sort of flashers on, uh, when you get to the part that's important to you or to your group, your eyes open. And then when you get to the part that doesn't have much interest to you or to your group, your eyes dim. So you, you actually read it, but it doesn't take hold of you as if it were a subcanon within the canon. I can remember, I have it in my my old Good News Bible in my office, my very first Bible that my mother bought me at Stop and Shop. And I read the Bible looking for verses that didn't prove, that disproved Calvinism. A brand new Christian, and obviously Calvinism was wrong. That was, that was evident. And so I'm, I set an alert in my brain when you read something that reinforces human freedom or suggests that Calvinism, as I understood it, can't be right, a little light would go on. But then there's lots of stuff that you just don't read because no one around you is saying, hey, pay attention to this. And I would say, in my experience as a Christian, the last few verses of Galatians chapter 3 are in large measure not considered very important in Christian practice or perhaps in Western church history. And you're, you're allowed to challenge me on that. And obviously that's based somewhat on my subjective experience, but I've had a lot of it. And I've been in a number of different contexts where Christians are gathering in one way or another and having conversations among themselves. And in so much of my reading, watching, conversing, this has very rarely come up as something that required our attention. If you're Reformed, well, it doesn't have anything to do with our debate with either Rome or the Arminians. Um, if you are Puritan, then you're pretty much living in a homogeneous society. So, but sanctification tended to be more personal and private than it was collective. Um, if you're in, well, any tradition where they have clear distinctives that they have to focus on and defend, no one seems to identify themselves with this. And so let me, let me read it. I brought my RSV because its position in Galatians 1 through 3 all by itself apart from the, the actual theology, suggests just how important this is to Paul. So if we're really going to understand what's happening here in our two columns, 
the comparison and the contrast between the Sinai covenant and what was contained within the Abrahamic covenant, it all leads to the end of chapter 3. Okay, so I'll read, I'll pick up in verse 23. Now before faith came, we were confined under the Namas, under Namas, kept under restraint until faith should be revealed, so that uh, the Namas was our uh, Pythagogos, the word we looked at last week, until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so that's very important to Protestants, that we might be justified by faith. But Paul goes on, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian or a guardian, a pedagogos, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, his offspring, and heirs according to the promise. So ever since verse 6 in chapter 3, after Paul sort of puts the question to the Galatians, uh, you are experiencing the Holy Spirit in a number of different ways. Christ crucified was preached to you in a very vivid form. So how, how do you explain your experience of the Spirit? Did that experience start when you responded to the Gospel with faith? Or did it really get underway when the troubler came in and said, hey, now that you are on the path to being Abraham's offspring, let's seal the deal by having the men circumcised. So you tell me, says Paul, when did that really get going? And the answer is obvious. It got going when they believed what they heard, when they responded with faith. And so Paul turns that on them in verse 6, thus Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So you see that it is men of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And so really, most of chapter 3 has been taken up with the question, who are the sons, who are, or who is, the seed of Abraham? And we're finally reaching the answer at the end. And it has nothing to do with observance of a covenant that was erected for a specific purpose and for a specific period of time. It has everything to do with being united to Abraham's offspring, meaning one, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've arrived at the goal of the promise that was made to Abraham, which wasn't simply one day you'll be justified by faith, but one day you'll be heirs of the promise that I made to Abraham. And so God's goal in the Abrahamic covenant has been achieved with the arrival of Jesus, but the fruit of that goal should be evident to all. A unified body of people where the distinctions that were made within the law no longer apply. So in that respect, there is equal standing for all the people groups and both genders and slave and free as long as they are in Christ Jesus. 
Okay, good night everybody. I like that song, Ray. Oh, thank you. That's helpful. Sometimes there's so many words going on, it's just nice to hear something kind of concise. Um, Sometimes there are so many words going on? You don't mean from me. You mean oh, from Harrison words. Morgan. Words. Chatty, yeah. chatty, chatty. Yeah. Me? That's mm. right. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little, what do I call it? Tedious. Tedious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Just reminding you. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of the the challenge of Galatians 3. Because up until verses 6 and 7, I think his argument is straightforward and fairly easy to understand. But when he has to plunge beneath the icy cold waters of dealing with the role of the Sinai Covenant in redemptive history, he's using shorthand that isn't easily accessible to us readers and listeners. And even with what we did, I kind of took shortcuts, right? We did not look at each Old Testament text, for instance, uh, and study them in their respective contexts. But the big picture, I think, is clear which I think comes out in these two columns, but it leads us to where we were headed. So the goal of redemption is what? Glory of God. Okay, okay that's the reformed answer. <laughs> of course, of course. What did she say? The glory of God. <laughs> Adoption to right. his family. Adoption into his family, but put, give it to me in Galatian terms. See, in some way... Oh, sorry, Bob? The promise that Abraham would be father of many nations. That's true. And what does it look like now? And by now, I mean since faith came. What happens, are you talking about the beginning of Galatians? What happened since faith came? I'm talking about the very end of Galatians 3. Oh. In other words, if this is what God intended to accomplish, Paul says he accomplished it. And the end of the story is not we're all justified by faith. Unity That's within the body? Unity? Yeah, I would, I would like to say it's a new humanity and a new humanity that is chiefly characterized by its unity under the under the law there was Jew and Gentile there was male and female there was slave and free but now there's unity because we're all in that respect on a level playing field as brothers and sisters in Christ, so that our identity in Christ, right, we've been baptized into Him. Not baptized in His name, or baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, though that's the proper form. We've been baptized into Christ, that is, into a union with Him, the great redemptive category that explains nearly all the others. And more than that, we've put on Christ as if Christ were an oversized overcoat so that when we put him on, he covers us completely. Both, term, both images are used side by side here at the end of Galatians. And this is typical of Paul's language elsewhere, Ephesians and Colossians. 
immediately come to mind. And so the outworking of this, the fruit bearing, if you will, is the unity of the church. So I don't think the end of Galatians teaches egalitarianism, in, at least in its popular form, because obviously in a sense, in fact, if I look around the room, there is at least male and female in the Church of Christ, right? But I have no more claim upon God than Debbie does, or than Emily does, or than Kara does, even though they are female. You remember that rabbinic prayer? Uh, I thank God that I was not born a Gentile or a woman. Okay. That prayer is important because it's not a prayer of contempt. It's not like, yuck. It's a prayer that says, because I'm a Jewish freeborn male, I can worship God. While the rest of you, certainly Gentiles, you are largely excluded or you operate under rules that are unique to your sex. Were women not free to worship God? When we talk, when we're talking about worship, we're talking about what? Circumcision? No, that's just that's the entry right. If you're Jewish, what is worship? Temple. Thank you. The temple. 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 That's the presence of God. Right? It's a mediated worship, but how many Levitical priests are named Miriam or Sarah? They're all male, and in a patriarchal culture, the men are representatives of their homes. And though they have their own um, clean and unclean requirements, nevertheless, the men are first and foremost, and the women are largely their property? Yes? Thank you, Kara. Yes, largely their property, right? Just read the law. Who wants to live under the law? That's always that baffles me. The place that, that it, where it puts women, it's, I think God is going, are you kidding me? Oy vey, what were they thinking? Didn't they read what Paul said at the end of Galatians, that those distinctions and restrictions, they've all been alleviated in this thing called the body of Christ. And so that's what that prayer meant. A freeborn Jewish male has opportunities for worship and service that are either denied or restricted to other people in the community. Paul says, now that faith has come, now that the seed of Abraham has come, the doors are thrown wide open to anyone who belongs to him, who's put on Christ, who's been baptized into Christ. So they have this kind of interesting dual identity. They are, on the one hand, the sons of God, now that sounds kind of restrictive, doesn't it? Why is it important, though, to say sons of God before I say children of God? What does your Bible say, Debbie? Sons. Does say sons? That's the word. And I think, uh, does anyone have another Bible? It's fine to sort of make a mental note that this ultimately means children of God, but our point of contact for our adoption is with the Son. And so, by virtue of His Sonship, we derive our identity in our union with Him to be sons. And then you can say sons and daughters.
And the Bible will say that in other places, children of God. And we're also the offspring of Abraham. So we're both. We're Abraham's sons and we're God's sons. Because faith has come. Because the Messiah has come. And so now, if we're reading this end of Galatians correctly, our identity in terms of a visible presentation to the world is our unity. What do you think of that? So let's read N.T. Wright's quote because we're doing a terrible job. Yes, yeah. yeah. I started thinking what N.T. Wright wrote down here probably a year or two into my ministerial labor here at Park Woods that I kept reading Paul carefully and then I would look around and realize nobody seemed interested in everything that Paul had to say. So when we did the Colossians Bible study, if you remember those of you who go way back, and I think some of you do, I said this was a chance for people to hear one letter from the very beginning, dear Colossians, all the way to the end, love Paul. So you can't just go into it, take out the nice piece that your group likes to focus on, or take out the nice piece that proves the other group is the wrong group. No, you've got to hear all of it. And if you're listening to everything Paul has to say, well, it's just like what Wright says here. Church unity is Paul's theme here, as indeed it is in every letter he wrote. And that's what, I can't say I discovered it like it was hidden and I had an epiphany. But I'm talking about the transition that goes from I have been shaped and molded by a church tradition which sort of puts me in a, in a track so that I read the Bible accordingly to, wait a minute, if I'm really paying attention to Paul, then he's saying things that no one seems to be talking about in my circles. Church unity is Paul's theme here, as indeed it is in every letter he wrote. When, therefore, we look at the church in the modern world, it seems to me obvious that, would, uh, that he would not only be shocked at our disunity, and this is the key phrase, he would not be able to comprehend that we don't care about it. He would simply not be able to grasp how people who have read and preached Romans and Galatians and the rest for hundreds of years could collude with rampant disunity. In particular, he would be horrified at the thought of disunity along ethnic, cultural, or social lines. And I think this is exactly right. If the end of Galatians 3 is a summary of what God intended to do through Abraham, then it's front and center. And it makes such perfect sense, doesn't it? Because what there is no other earthly force that in a productive, positive way produces the kind of unity that Paul has in mind here. Or am I wrong? The military might, depending on the military, but, and I'm, I love the military, so I'm not saying anything negative about it, but it's a kind of unity that's forged within the context of war making, even if you're not actually at war. The idea is there is an us, and we build collegial unity, esprit de corps, and there is them, and the them are the bad guys, and we fight against them. 
So I'm talking about a unity that has really no other constraint except the power of the Holy Spirit. He's creating a unified people. But in a sense, we are like the military as the people of God because we're in a battle here and we need each other to help us in this battle. Um, so that battle hopefully will bring us together so we can look out for one another, help one another, be a presence in the world in which we live. Does that make sense? Oh, I think it makes perfect sense. And what I just want to keep reinforcing on this point is that's the goal of God's redemptive work in Christ for his people in their communities. It's not the ultimate goal, of course, that's resurrection and glorification, but things like justification by faith, which I heartily subscribe to, have in view the creation of a new humanity, which is supposed to look different than the old humanity. And it doesn't look different because all the men grow funny beards and won't use modern technology because the Amish certainly look different. You all know the Amish, right? And they have their own tightly knit communities. Who wants to be Amish? No one? Is Amish living an open invitation to unbelievers to taste and see that the Lord is good? I don't think it is. So somehow this supernatural unity is set forth as new creation living that sends a message to the larger world where there is Jew and Gentile, there is black and white, there is Chinese and Japanese, and all the rest of the divisions, that the new world has already begun. And it's visible here among these spirit-filled people who are united to Christ by faith. I think that's really cool. But it doesn't, it doesn't raise money or sell books or get anything through Congress or get prayer back in school or doesn't, doesn't do anything. How many of you in and of yourselves, I'll use the, one of the popular words in Christianity, have a passion for it? And I would say that's perfectly good New Testament thinking, that it is actually part of the battle. Because isn't that what Galatians is about so far? This, if this is what's at stake, Paul's not just saying, hey, justification by faith is the way to go, not works of the law, right? It's not faith versus works here. It's faith in Jesus Christ versus the works of the law. 
That's what Paul's fighting, but he's fighting for an idea that's not just which way are you going to choose to be justified. He's fighting for the idea that he summarizes at the end of chapter 3. That's what he's fighting for. So it's a battle. It's not just keep circumcision out. It's if you do this, then you've changed the entire character of the people of God and you've actually are in retrograde movement backward to the present evil age where God actually incorporated those divisions that were characteristic of a fallen world into his covenant and into his worship. But this doesn't provoke a reformation or a counter-reformation. And strangely enough, maybe the only way to accomplish it would be if uh, our group left the main group, and then we could work on our unity more. But in my experience, I find over and over again that the default position, whether at the level of denomination or, say, life in a local church, is not unity as an ideal, but what I think is best for me. So when I have to make a decision, preserving unity doesn't have much weight in the decision making. It doesn't happen that way at the denominational level, and it doesn't happen that way at the personal level. And I'm painting with a broad brush, right, when I say it doesn't. So it would be interesting to think about church unity the way we think about marriage, especially Christian marriage. Christian marriage is both a very real experience for those who are in it, but it's also an ideal that was established before the fall and has now been recovered in the redemptive work of Christ, right? In fact, there's a very Galatian idea in there when Jesus says, it was not so from the beginning. And Moses gave you divorce because of hardness of heart. Paul could have picked up on that theme because under that temporary covenant, there were concessions made to human fallenness. But now that the new covenant has arrived, we're returning to the original ideal. So if your marriage or my marriage is struggling at any point in time, if you're a Christian, you hold to the ideal that marriage is glorifying to God in and of itself as a way to sort of persevere through the bumps and the bruises that you may be experiencing at the moment. Does, does that make sense? Is, or are you all just continually delighted and uh, overwhelmed with joy every day you live in, within the boundaries of your household? We are, aren't we, Marcia? Of course. Of course. But in the same way that you people say, well, divorce isn't an option, right? Christians say that. For Christians, divorce isn't an option. Maybe Christians should, should say breaking apart isn't an option because the unity of the church has a place that's as valuable in and of itself as marriage does for a Christian man and a Christian woman who are joined in it. I feel like, though, I mean, at Park Woods, I feel like there's hopefully a displays of unity uh, because there's a lot, even though we're mostly white, not completely, but we come from different types of backgrounds, um, different occupations, and it seems like over the years, I mean, speak positively that there has been unity and care and 
concern and love for one another, maybe not perfectly, but I think there are evidences of that. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I'm not talking about Park Woods per se, but how Christians in the West tend to think. In other words, where are their passions? Where do they put their money? What do they subscribe to in their statements of faith? Um, what do they do when things get rough and there are bumps and bruises ahead? And Paul says that we're actually to do all that we can to preserve the unity of the church. He says that to the Ephesians. But that's so open-ended that I could say, well, I tried, and it didn't work. So I guess what I'm talking about is if this, play, if this has as high a place in Paul's theology as Galatians suggests, and as Wright says, this is what he says in all of his epistles, then maybe it deserves a, a higher level of investment and attention from the church than it receives. How many of you have in the past read through Galatians 3, stopped here, and just meditated on this? How many of you knew what union with Christ was before I came here? You might have. And we can always know it better, can't we? But there are places where it probably doesn't even come up. And yet Paul says, this is the whole ball game. And how, how are we, we meaning the church, how are we getting us going on? Oh. Is it the two age thing? Yeah, in part. And I you know, I think when Debbie talked about fighting for it, that reminded me that's what Paul's doing here. He's fighting for this. So we're we're not Jesus left the tomb probably twenty five years earlier. I've been here for 28 years, so that's not that long. And already the church in this part of Asia Minor is succumbing to a doctrine that leads them to break apart, not necessarily their local bodies, but they're rearranging and creating hierarchies by adopting circumcision and uh, Torah observance. So the apostles are still alive. When you live in, in a culture that is as free as ours, then really anything goes, I suppose. Plus there's a devil at work. There's a, a lady from somewhere, she's on TikTok. I don't watch TikTok. But she shows up in my Facebook, and she's an ardent dispensationalist of the classic pre-mill, the charts kind, you know, three and a half years into Antichrist rule. And it's like, she's not accountable to anybody. She just posts videos of herself, and people are writing in. And finally, I wrote one and just said, I've been listening to this since the late 70s, and you're still singing the same tune. Nothing's changed, right? It's just on social media. Yeah, but it, we all thought Jesus was going to be back certainly by the 80s. And then they had to redefine what a generation was. And, but it's still the seven week, the only doctrinal debate is when does the rapture occur? Not, is any of this rubbish? Which, by and large, it is. But she's there, she can do whatever she wants. She's on TikTok. 
And by looking at her once, all of a sudden <laughs> I'm getting her whole canon of teaching. So, so it's, yeah, it's a crazy world. But if the church could collectively embrace this as an ideal to work toward, then perhaps there would be a kind of overall improvement. In, in how the church functioned. I don't know. And I think that's kind of what Wright's saying. It's really not even a part of the conversation. But the flip side of that disunity is painful. And it hurts. And it drives people away. It's, so unity should be at the top of our mind. Right. Well, what is disunity then? What is it? When uh, I want it my way or the highway. Right, but in terms, of, in terms of Galatians, what is disunity? It's going back to the law. It, or it's how the yes. present evil age functions. Mm -hmm. So that's what old humanity does. What's new about the new humanity? Well, it can't be united either. So how does it demonstrate that Jesus is indeed the Lord, right? Because that's what we're doing when we prioritize church unity as an end in and of itself. Even justification by faith is a means to an end, right? That's what Galatians 3 has been telling us. The end is... No male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. A new humanity, which is an announcement that Jesus is the Lord. He's in charge of us. He rules over us. And when he has his way, this is what his people looks like. What his people look like, looks like. What the church looks like. How about that? It's a collective, right? So if you break up over anything and everything, what are you saying? Jesus isn't Lord here, because this isn't important to us. Was that you, Bob? Oh, it might have been. I, my, my chair squeaked. Oh, okay. So if Mr. Smith were the Pope of Protestantism and could make the church look more unified, what would you envision that looking like? Oh boy. You know, that's, that's a very interesting question. Let's meet one more time. <laughs> what was the question? Oh, if I were Protestantism's Pope, what would I implement to create church unity? What would it look like? And it's funny that you bring that up because I was, as I'm working through this in my head, I'm sort of thinking in the opposite direction. Maybe, I'm not committing to this. Don't misunderstand. Just thinking. Maybe this is a vote for congregationalism that the more we unite institutionally, right? Not in terms of our spiritual union with one another, but the more we unite denominationally uh, in this larger quasi-business capacity, the more stress and strain there will be on unity at every level. So that perhaps, just perhaps, don't, don't tell them that I'm agnostic and that I'm running away from um, a connectedism in Christianity, that maybe this is the preserve of the local church. That neither you nor I can do anything about all the other churches in the world. But we have a stewardship right here that we'll have to answer for. 
and therefore this is where we invest our energy in a far more manageable group of people who aren't just united because they say the Apostles' Creed, but they're actually united by the Holy Spirit. Organically. So, it's too vast. And that's why we have a Pope. And he presides like a Lord over a vast empire. And I think the unity can really only be expressed locally. I'm just throwing that out. Otherwise, I would burn anyone who disagreed with me until they all conformed. It's important to remember how little and powerless the Christian Church was in the first few decades of its existence, which is what we're reading about. And yet Paul has this vision of it, not in terms of its enormity that one day it's going to rule the medieval world, but that it will exist within communities that are larger than it is, but not so large that the community can ignore what exists within its boundaries, namely this thing called the church that holds out the word of life to the unbelieving world, that is prepared to have an answer for its hope when it's asked. So it's, I'm sort of flipping it. I'm doing what politicians do. I think the important question is something completely unrelated to yours. And now I'll spend the rest of the time answering it. But I'm wondering if it's just too big a thing. And so the only thing that matters is that there are 10 of us in the room or so and 10 more maybe on screen and that's what we have to work with. So it can be our values. And maybe it's just something we have to be like every uh, first Sunday when we meet as a congregation for prayer, that we pray for this. Yeah. And yeah. just all remind ourselves that we're all in this together and it's something we desire and so we pray for it. I think that's that's exactly how Paul would pray. And we can have the same color t-shirts. There was a, a young lady from one of the graduate schools, I can't remember. She had a very nice paper on the community in Colossians. And so I made sure that I attended that because I'm so familiar with Colossians. And I, I wish I had the notes in front of me. But she fleshed out some of the things that I'm talking about tonight within the, the book of Colossians. But she skipped chapter 2, verse 19. So I brought it to her attention that in verse 2, 19, Paul talks about the one who's leading them astray as being cut off from the head, right? But then he talks about the body that's knit together with its joints and sinews, which provides the avenue for the whole body's nourishment. And I think Paul's point there is no one can experience proper connectedness to the head apart from proper connectedness to the other body parts. So there is, in that ultimate sense, there is no head and body and everything just kind of works like this. It's head to body and it all 
sort of moves through that body, much like oxygen saturated blood moves through the human body, it won't get to my hand if it doesn't have a shoulder, uh, this part, a forearm and a wrist and all the veins and nerves in between. So Paul would effectively say you, you are functionally decapitated if you're not a part of a united body of believers because they are genuinely united to the head by the Spirit. That's why at the top of this, it's not the Abrahamic covenant, but it's Christ and the Spirit. That's, the, that's what this was waiting for. So the unity is within churches, not, not uh, like communities like, like Whitfield. I mean, we are all Christians, but there is, I hope, at least, you know, faculty and staff, I hope. Um, but, I mean, we don't celebrate the sacraments together. They, they say we worship together, maybe. Kind of. kind of. But, I mean, you know, we don't have a, an ordained pastor, you know. But, again, we don't get the sacraments together. So, the unity is within the churches with, that we're members of. Remember that clause, we're the local expression of the body of Christ? And I said, I vehemently oppose that because a, a Christian school cannot claim that identity. That belongs exclusively to what the New Testament calls the church. It's not distributed out to any Christian organization. It's just not. The church, that is his body. That's, the two are the same. I mean, you can make distinctions in terms of its visibility or its government or the way it assembles, but simply because you put Christian on a thing doesn't make it the body of Christ. Why does it say that? Everywhere. I mean, in other words... In, in Whitfield documents? Maybe? Remember, we talked about it. Yeah, I'm getting old. And, yeah, I know. Well, I am too. What were we talking about? Okay, never mind. I'll check the tape. It's in there. Yeah, and in the handbook or the mission. You no, know, and that thing everyone was signing, yeah. it was kind of controversial. No, right. As the local expression of the body of Christ. No, you're Christians and you've gotten together for a very good cause, educating your children, and you can afford it, and you can afford the property and to pay people who are gifted to carry out this function. It's wonderful to have this, but you're not the body of Christ. Does this have anything to say about relationships with other denominations or other churches? Or? That's kind of Harrison's question, and to me that's a nightmare. <laughs> it really is. I, yeah. I mean, it's hard enough with 80 people, right. uh, I, so I can't even conceive of it. But I, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was having lunch with some other ministers in the presbytery and they're upset that there is so much strife within the PCA right now. That's fine, there is. Whether you come down on one side or the other doesn't negate the fact that there is strife. And this one minister, I respect his opinion, and he said, well, you know, if it continues this way, we'll have to start a new denomination. Mm -hmm. And I just went, no. I didn't do it that way. Was he serious? Yeah. Because that's what you do when things go south. You start a new thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, at the very least, why not go into the OPC? At least it's already there, mm -hmm. you know. But, the, but it's the reflex now in Western Christianity. If something's broke and it can't be fixed, start something new. And this ideal, whether it can even belong to an organization as big as the PCA, wasn't a part of the conversation. In other words, if we're putting cards on the table the unity card wouldn't have been 
a very, it would have been like a four of spades or a five of diamonds. You know, it's there, but it's not going to take the stack. Um, so even the, I, well, he wasn't interested in that because the OPC has its own way of doing things and it's kind of a awkward group of people and they, they scrutinize everything. I thought, fair enough, but something new, always something new. No, why can't we just, but it doesn't work that way. And we can, we're rich enough to do that. So there's more of a preaching thing tonight, but if you come away with anything, it's the heart of Galatians is not mid chapter three, it's at the end of chapter three. So the battle, the warfare going on over circumcision is ultimately a battle over new versus old humanity and the erasure of distinctives, distinctions rather, within a group of people in terms of now creating a, a unified human race that glorifies God, we got that in, because when it is unified, it does glorify God. It says, indeed, Jesus, you are the Lord. Look how we conduct ourselves. We take your interest in our unity with great seriousness, so we fight for it. And then it tells the world there is a different way to be human because they can't figure it out. They're ruled by their passions, their interests, their tribes, their loyalties, their politics, their A to Z. They cannot. In fact, the part of the brilliance of the United States was we've got to keep everybody together despite their disparate interests, economies, and cultures. So we'll go very lightly on how we operate at the federal level which of course had some serious repercussions for people like African Americans. Said, all right, we're gonna, we've gotta keep the South in, so uh, we'll talk about slavery later. For now, keep it. Um, why did I say that? Oh, because the world can't get along with itself. And it wants to so badly, but it can't. Because Jesus doesn't rule over them, and they don't have the Holy Spirit. But they knew that things could be better. And they... That's, that's kind of implanted within us that they can't get there. I think that's right, Ron. I think it's an image of God thing that there is some waking dream that we used to be something that we could be again or however you want to put it even if they would scoff at the fall of the first man and the first woman there are ideals there that everybody wants which I think is why those things reemerge in the prophets So that's it for Galatians 1 through 3. If we get back for Galatians 4 through 6, Galatians 4 gives us more of what's going on in chapter 3, including the famous allegory passage with Sarah and Hagar. That starts in January, right? <laughs> no, that's yeah. the, that's the downtime. That's the hibernation time when all the Christmas lights go out and the days are about five hours long and it's always cold. We did those studies and I thought, oh, this is so dreary to go out. So. So I'd like to start a new church called the Church of Unity. I think there is one in Kansas City. Yeah, there is one, isn't there? <laughs> and they, you know, to get it, they had to basically say there is no doctrine. Right. Uh, ours 
will be the, the Orthodox Church of Unity. That's right. That's right. We're going back to basics. <laughs> the Orthodox. Yeah. That reminds me of when I first saw this thing called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I was still in, I was still a Pentecostal, and I thought, Presbyterian is bad enough. What could the Orthodox be? Turned out they were a very lovely group of people. I was quite pleasantly surprised. That's how I got into the OPC, how we got in way, way back when. You know where I hear this verse the majority of the time, at least in today? It's in regards to CRT and all that kind of discussion within the church. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's also a woman, a woman in ministry verse. So in other words, there's an interest, a special interest. That's how it kind of I started tonight. When we're interested in something, then our eyes open. But that's not Paul's point. You know, it's not CRT, and it's not whether women should be ordained or not. That's a perfectly biblical question, but it's not answered, I, I don't think, in Galatians 3. So yeah, now it's moved on from women in ministry to CRT. What's CRT? Um, critical race theory. Oh, that. Okay, yeah. But once again, there's a secular, worldly di uh, movement that's seeking to achieve in its own worldly fallen way what God has already achieved in keeping his promise to Abraham. So everything that goes on around us is in one way or another sort of a counterfeit of the genuine article, which is sort of what Ram was saying a minute ago. And if we can't produce it, then how are we ever going to be a, a city on a hill whose light can't be hidden so that men will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven? We just, we look like everybody else. All right, I'm going home for dinner and the last episode of Lost in Space. I'll admit it, I watched it. I loved that show when I was a kid. Oh, you weren't a kid then. Some of you were kids then. Yeah, did you watch Lost in Space? I loved Lost in Space. Is there a remake or something? Yeah. Okay. It's actually very cheesy. <laughs> very. <laughs> it's horrible. All right, yeah, Sue. I'm much older than you that I thought it was horrible. The remake or the original? Well, I didn't see the remake. I'm talking about the originals. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the, the new version is a much more complete three over three seasons arc story. But it's got a lot of corny dialogue. But the one redeeming factor is the robot. It's a cool robot. And the robot says, danger, Will Robinson. That's what caught me. And he says it in such a cool way. Dare I ask what the plot is, knowing the title? Oh, yes, the, basically they're a colony of, uh, what, earthlings who have to recolonize to Alpha Centauri, which was sort of what the first one was about. The Swiss family Robinson became the space family Robinson, and they head off to Alpha Centauri, and then they get marooned and lost in space. When I was a kid, it was sort of you were either for Lost in Space or Star Trek. 
later in life I became much more enamored with Star Trek. But as a little kid, Did Wednesday night, who? Doctor Who. Oh, Kara. <laughs> Doctor Who? No. Dr. Smith was in it. And then people called me Dr. Smith because I shared that name. And there is a Dr. Smith in this one. But I'm up to the last episode, so I've got to see how it turns out. With my chicken sandwich and potato chips. Danger, Will Robinson. It's so cool. It's worth it just for that. This is why I get along with seventh graders so well, because I am one. All right, everybody. I'll say good night. We'll see you next time. Same bat channel. Good night. Have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Sue. You too. It's around the corner. I know. Oh, and just if anybody wants to come Friday night, there's still open seats for the church. Oops, I cut that off. That was that was a mistake. Darn it. Can I stay at your house tonight, Harrison? That was just a touchpad that was... Hair trigger. Because I, I always use a mouse with this. Yeah, it was hair trigger. Right when she was about to finish the announcement.